Amen. Good morning, church. Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2. Progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. To improve, it's a change. To be perfect, it's a change often. Winston Churchill. Change is a law of life. And those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. John F. Kennedy. Without change, something sleeps inside of us and seldom awakens. The sleeper must awaken. Frank Herbert. If change is so crucial to our existence, to our progress, and to our success, then why is it that we sometimes dread it the most? See, people are very open-minded about new things as long as they're exactly like the old things. You know, we are creatures of habit. We get used to things. We get settled and we get comfortable. What does Jesus have to say about this this morning? In Matthew 18, verse 3, he says, Truly, I tell you, now, Jesus doesn't have to say truly, because whatever Jesus says, it's true. Are you with me? Yeah. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. We must change. There really is no option if you desire salvation. The sermon today is entitled, The Call to Change. This morning, we're going to look at the early part of Moses' life and extract some biblical principles that will enable you and I to be the agents of change that God desires. Are you with me? Exodus chapter 2. We'll start off reading in verse 11. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew. The man said, well, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. You know, Moses was a prince, groomed from an early age to be the ruler of a nation, the most powerful nation of the time. See, Moses was used to making his own decisions. He was used to relying on his own experience, on his own education, on his own training, i.e., he was used to relying on himself. The scripture tells us here is that he went out where his people were. See, God did not direct him to do this. He saw the Hebrew getting beaten up by the Egyptian. And then here comes Moses and kills the Egyptian. Why is that? Because it's what Moses thought best. The Pharaoh finds out. And it's trouble for Moses. He wants to get his head on a chopping block. Are you with me? This one decision, one decision changed the whole course of Moses' life. My first point is you must change your mind. Go to Proverbs chapter 14. 
called to change. You must first change your mind. Proverbs 14 and in verse 12, the scripture says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. See, God says, man's intuition, man's mind falls short every time and unfortunately leads to pain. Our society, both religious and non-religious, have proven to us without a shadow of a doubt that they have no clue how to live life. About 40 to 50 percent of non-religions, non-Christians, their marriages end in divorce. Well, let's look at the statistic amongst those who claim to be Christians. 50 to 60 percent of their marriages end in divorce. Today, we have an epidemic across the nation of men who are addicted to pornography. 4.5 billion, hear me, billion hours are spent nationwide watching pornography. A nationwide study conducted by Proven Men Ministries, a nonprofit Christian organization, found the following. The study claims that 3 out of 10 men between the ages of 18 and 30 are daily viewers of pornography. But how about amongst those who claim to be Christians? Among men who claim to be Christian, a stunning 7% of males admit to viewing pornography several times in a day. Depression rates are highest among young people, leaping from by 63% for teens and 47% for millennials. The rates were also twice as high among women as men. There's a quote by a senior vice president of Blue Cross Blue Shield who said, We are concerned that depression rates are continuing to accelerate, and we need to do more work to identify the underlying cause. Let me tell you something. The underlying cause is clear and has been clear for centuries. All these problems are a problem of man's arrogance and thinking that we know best how to run our lives. If so, then why is it that we subscribe to these ideologies and these norms? Honestly, the fact is, It's just more comfortable. It's just easier. But in this room, not in this room, in this room, we are ready to revolt against the conforms of this society. We are on a mission to be transformed. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. All of us are called to change according to Jesus. And in order to do that, you and I must first change our minds. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, Paul begins the dialogue here with the church in Rome, and he explains that transformation begins with your mind. This world has trained us how to think, what to feel, and what to value. But we must make a decision that we're going to refrain from adopting that and instead align our lives to the Word of God. I need the Bible to wash my brain. Are you with me? I got enough stuff in media trying to wash my brain. 
Here's the thing. Let me just clue you in on something. You are being brainwashed one way or another, and I choose to be brainwashed by the word of God. Are you with me? See, here's where Moses went wrong. He thought, he thought his way was the right way. His plans were Moses-led, not God-led. How so? Well, Moses became impatient. He chose to act out of impulse and jumped the gun when it wasn't yet God's timing for him to deliver the people. This one emotional decision spiraled and took him out. Here's a fact. A lack of emotional discipline will take you out of the kingdom of God. It will stop you in your tracks spiritually. It will cause you to say and do things that you will one day regret. I'm sure Moses would have wished he would have had a little more self-control and not have done what he did. Some say, well, Fernando, you just simply do not understand. I've just been this way for a long time. See, the reality is that I always feel this way. And as a result, you give free reign to everything you feel. I'm going to show you when I'm unhappy. I'm going to walk into a room and you're going to know that I am not happy with you. Wow. And you wear your emotions on your sleeves. Thinking, well, that's just the way I am. Here's the thing. Just because that's who you've been, that's not who God expects you to be. Are you with me? One of the biggest compliments you can ever get is someone close to you saying to you, I want the old Fernando. I want the old you. You know, today I celebrate 24 years as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I love all those close to me. I love my family. I love my immediate family, extended family. But I can tell you, there's been time where they're like, where is the old Fernando? Because, see, we had more in common. Because I was involved in the same things they were involved in. But my Bible says the following. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. See, clothes often shape and influence someone's identity. You know, it's depending what you wear, sometimes, not always, but sometimes signals who you are. See, God expects you and I to change our shirt every day, brothers and sisters. He actually expects you to do your laundry every single day. Not every month, every day. I've seen, I've seen people. You know what? We, you guys know we open our home to all of you. And our washer and our dryer are yours. It's there. Not charging you anything. There's no quarters required. But I've seen like humongous bags of laundry walk into my house. So I... Either you have a lot of clothes, or you just need to wash more often. Are you with me? God is saying to you, if you've been baptized into Christ as a disciple of Jesus, you've been clothed with Christ. And every day we walk out in the world and we get dirty. And he's saying, you got to remember, you got to change that shirt you got to put it in the laundry. Something you got to put some detergent. Something you got to put some chlorine on that shirt. In some ways, I think that we've begun to tolerate certain things in our own lives. Keep in mind that what you tolerate is what you become. 
You and I need to plan to change our mind if we plan to change how we feel. I remember when we were living in Portland, we are trying to find a sport for my daughter Andrea to get involved in. Now, I've shared the story about soccer. That wasn't her thing. We tried t-ball. That wasn't her thing. So I said, hey, how, maybe some swimming, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's an individual sport. Uh, maybe that's what we do. So remember, we started getting her in some swimming classes. And, you know, the first couple of classes, she was doing really well. You know, she was kind of getting, getting the hang of it. But then while I was driving home one day, and, and I could see her from my rearview mirror, she was really discouraged. And I said, Andrea, what's going on? She said, you know what, Dad? You know, it's just that in class, all the other kids, they, they advance to the next level. And I'm still in level one. I just can't do this, Dad. And she, our mic had shut down. She had given up. I said, Andrea, I parked our car. I got right in the back seat with her. I said, Andrea, here's the thing. You're a Chavez. <laughs> and in our home, we don't know the word can't. That is not in our vocabulary. You got to persevere. Of course you can do it. Of course you can be better. Of course you go to the next level. You know, it's funny because not too long after that, she kept advancing. Then she told me, Dad, can I join the swim team when I get to high school, Dad? I just fired up. You got to change your mind if you want to change how you feel. I love the practical that one of my dear brothers, Cesar Limon, who leads the church in Portland, told me. He said, look, he described it like this. You need to become good at punishing your thoughts. We all need to get better at punishing our thoughts that are not God-directed. Don't let them run wild. We've all gone to Target and seen that one kid who's just like running wild. He's throwing a tantrum on the floor. He's yelling and crying. And you know it. What's going through your mind saying, if I was his parents, if I was his parents, I would never allow that. That would never happen under my leadership. Yeah, what's interesting enough is sometimes we allow our minds to act that way. Our thoughts are throwing tantrums all day long, and we just keep giving them the lollipop. Instead of punishing the thoughts. Some of you are studying the Bible. You know what you must do, but you've been entertaining thoughts of self-doubt. You need to punish those thoughts. See, Satan knows how to control us. He controls us first with our mind. Don't even entertain those thoughts. See, feelings are normal, but God expects you to filter them through his will. See, if what you feel is contrary to what God expects you to do, then you and I must transform and renew our minds to his words. Here's the exciting thing. The moment you stop putting limits on God and what you're willing to submit to in terms of his word, the faster and the sooner you are to avoid the pain that you're causing by allowing those thoughts to go wild. Just ask yourself, what has my way of running my life led to be? I can tell before I was a disciple 24 years ago. I remember that I was involved in different groups in high school. I became a disciple at the age of 15. And at the age of 15, I was already immoral. I was already going to parties and drinking and getting drunk at the age of 15. And see, the age, and that was 20 years ago. The generation has changed and shifted. Where now it's earlier and earlier and earlier where our youth are getting involved in so many things. You know, King Solomon, who had all the wisdom, the wealth, the power in the world, after pursuing pleasure, everything in his eyes desired, he came to one conclusion. Turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. 
We're studying the books in the Bible, so you should know what book Ecclesiastes comes after. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm not going to quiz you. I'll give you a break. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Let's start reading here in verse 13. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. See, there are no shortcuts to knowing God's will. We must peel ourselves away from the thinking of this society and our life, our world, in this life to God's word. For example, what would the world look like if we align our thinking to the way Jesus loves us? Any atheist will tell you, that would be a better world. What else do we need to align our lives with? Go to Exodus chapter 2. The second point is, if we're going to be called to change, we need to fight the resistance that brings change. Exodus chapter 2. We'll pick up where we left off. At this point, Moses is running for his life. Pharaoh wants to kill him. He goes to Midian. He goes to the desert. And in verse 16 in chapter 2, we'll pick it up there. It says, Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Reuel, their father, he asked him, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Reuel asked his daughters, why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gerashim, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. So you have here that the bad choices of Moses leads him to Midian, which basically is a desert. This is where he flees to. And if you remember, the Bible says that he flees, and it says that he sat down by a well. The word sat in the Hebrew means to dwell. Here we get a glimpse into the state of Moses' heart. He was wallowing in discouragement, feeling hopeless, and disappointed at himself. He couldn't believe where his life had ended up. How did I possibly end up here? Here's the truth. When you take things into your own hands, God will send you to a desert for a time of testing until there is a heart change. A hard change is when you have bended your will to his will. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. How does God accomplish the bending of your will to his? Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's pick it up here in verse 5. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastens everyone 
he accepts as his son. How does God work to allow you to bend your will to his? The Bible describes it here as he applies discipline. But he also reminds us not to forget how he addresses you. See, in God's innate nature, discipline is a must. We live in a society where parents do not discipline their children. And you have children who have no character. And they're out there, out of control. He also says, don't lose hearts. Don't sit by a well, dwelling on what's happening in your life. Interesting in verse 6, it says, he chastens everyone he accepts as son. The word chasten in the Greek is the word scourge, which means to whip. A thing that causes trouble and pain. See, we like the acceptance part of the scripture where he says he accepts us as sons, but we don't like it that God actually chastens us. He will allow your life to feel like it's in disarray. He will allow your marriage to start crumbling. He will allow your health to decline. He will allow your financial situation to suffer. He will allow your relationships to grow sour. He will allow your work to be harder. All with the intention to help you drop the resistance and choose to obey him. You know, it's interesting being a parent. And you will one day get there. But it seems like even the little things, sometimes it's a bit of a battle of wills. And I would say that probably one of the toughest parts is in the evenings. Some of you who have babysat for us can understand the concept of brush your teeth. Just brush your teeth. It's such a difficult and daunting task for an eight-year-old. And but see, what's interesting, they'll begin to reason with you. So tell me, why do I need to brush my teeth? I mean, I brushed them yesterday, right? And I mean, you want me to go to bed, right? So I, I can go to bed? And just be done with this, Dad. And there's like this rationale and this going, and it's a battle of the will. And this is what we do with God. We argue and we fight with God. We throw tantrums, expecting him to bend his will for ours. But yet he doesn't. He's our heavenly father, and he disciplines us. Your responsibility is what Proverbs 3.11 says. It says, do not resent his rebuke. In these short verses, we begin to see how Moses' state begins to change. The scripture says that he moves from sitting down by the well where he gets up. He comes to the rescue, but it isn't impulsive. He doesn't kill those shepherds. He keeps his composure. You see that Moses is starting to grow. And the second part is, what's impressive, is that he waters the flock. Moses gets amongst the smelly, dirty sheep and waters them. He doesn't see himself as his high leader he begins to accept his new role. He resists the entitlement that he was the Pharaoh to be and is willing to put the hat of a servant. Furthermore, he chooses to marry Zipporah, which tells you that he begins to embrace this stage in his life. He gives up the dream 
to be the most powerful leader of the world. And instead, accepts the fact that he might be toiling the land with sheep for the rest of his life. Even though it was completely opposite of anything he ever thought would happen to his life, he begins to surrender. He begins to fight the resistance against himself. See, when God is in the plan, it just flows, baby. It just moves like water. But when the flesh is in it, it just feels forced. And it's not of God. Moses begins to learn the art of surrender. I hear this. Bro, I just feel so much pressure. I feel like I'm being broken in two. Hey, your feeling is normal because you simply have not surrendered. You're trying to do the spiritual splits. You're trying to surrender to God, but surrender to your own will, and you just begin to like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. See, you, and you begin to feel that tug. You, feel, you begin to feel that tug because you simply have chosen not to listen to God's will, but to listen to yours. Matthew 21, verse 44 says, Anyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. You have so much anxiety in your life, some of you in this room. You have so much nerves and stress in your life. And this simply is as a result of a heart that is fighting to surrender God. You need to decide to be humble and resist your own will. What you'll find in scriptures is that God is especially hard on those who are religious. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 7. Why is that? Why is it Jesus was harder on those that had religion in their life? Let's look at this in verse 51 of Acts chapter 7. If we're going to change, you must fight, and it will be a fight to fight against the resistance of your heart. Verse 51, the scripture says, you stiff-necked people. I mean, Jesus was really trying to fire them up here. Yeah. Really trying to win them over. <laughs> you stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You're just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. He says, you stiff-necked people. You stubborn people. You resist the Holy Spirit. Since your heart's and your ears are uncircumcised. See, in the Old Testament, being circumcised was a signal of you being a part of God's people. But it says your hearts are uncircumcised. So you're not God's people, even though you think you know the law. Because their deeds reflect it. They received the law, but they did not obey it. Hebrews 3.12 says, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today, you and I have an opportunity to listen to the voice of God. But choose not to resist the Spirit of God that is speaking to you. He's urging you to stop fighting and to let him expose what he needs to expose in your life. Which is why I'm encouraged. Because here today you are surrounded with a group of people who are willing to accept 
God's discipline, who are willing to accept his sovereignty and therefore refuse to be like the masses, who cringe at the thought of being religious, but who choose to bend their will to theirs. See, we are surrounded by a group of people in this room who want to fight the resistance of their hearts. You and I have a choice to surrender to God or to fight him at this game called life. You and I have a decision. Are we going to surrender our lives? Are we going to stop fighting or not? Let me close here in Exodus chapter 3. Moses seems to have had some growth spiritually. He's beginning to make some decisions in his life. And he begins to answer the call. So you and I are called to change, to change our hearts, to change our minds. And lastly, we need to make the change to make God our top priority. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Since now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, where the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why does the bush not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land of flowing milk and honey, a home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Parasites, Hivites, and Jebusites. There's a lot of people in that land, amen? And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians have oppressed them. So now go, I am sending you. Moses starts hearing the voice of God calling him from a burning bush. What's so fancy about this bush? Nothing really. It was just an ordinary bush. Yet what's awesome is that it became extraordinary because God took possession of it. He was foreshadowing what he wanted to do with Moses, whose heart and dreams had withered. It's not until God tells Moses who he is that he understands the nature of his calling. But God stops him. He says, look, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for this place is holy grounds. God is saying, if you're going to come into my presence, if you want to be close to me, if you want to have a relationship with me, it's going to require change. Therefore, God says, before you do anything else, make this your top priority. Change. Take off what is dirty. Your sandals. We need to make the need for us to change the number one priority in our lives. This is what God explains to them next. The need. I am sending you. God's calling of Moses really is an act of grace. Moses couldn't believe. But God, I dropped the ball 40 years ago. I killed someone. And you still want to use me. It was out of grace. 
None of this would have ever been possible if God's priority did not become his top priority. I'm excited today because Carlos has come to be baptized. He's the real deal. A man who is urgent about removing anything from his life that would hinder his ability to honor God. I remember counting the cost with him just yesterday. I said, Carlos, you're going to go from sinner to save sinner. You're still going to sin. But you still need to walk in this world. Your sandals will get dirty. But you need to make it a conviction that you're going to walk in the light from on forward. See, staying completely transparent in your life is a top priority to God. Because it stops the movement of God when we don't. It's exciting this coming year. We are, have on the docket to plant nine more churches. We're going to go to Auckland, New Zealand. Davao, Philippines. Amsterdam, Netherlands. Johannesburg, South Africa. Lima, Peru. Kathmandu, Nepal. Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And here in the good old USA, Atlanta, Georgia, and, and Salt Lake City, Utah. Do you see the need? We started this church only six years ago with 30 people who wanted to dream to save the Bay Area for Jesus Christ. Now we are across four different regions with over 200 disciples, and we have plans to plant our fifth region in Hayward very soon. And here's the good news. We're just getting started. This morning, God is calling you to remove anything that will prevent you from answering the call to change. What will it require? Making a change. I'll close with the lyrics of a great song by Matthew West, I'm not singing it. <laughs> that you will not get me to do. But maybe, just maybe, I will change that. But not today. The lyrics go like this. This might hurt. It's not safe. But I know that I've got to make a change. I don't care if I break. At least I'll be feeling something. Because just okay is not enough. Help me fight through the nothingness of life. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to go one more day with all your all-consuming passion inside of me. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I had given everything instead of going through the motions? No regrets, not this time. I'm going to let my heart defeat my mind. Let your love make me whole. I think I'm finally feeling something. Because just okay is not enough. Help me fight through the nothingness of this life because I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to go one more day without your all-consuming passion inside of me. I don't want to spend my whole life asking, what if I had given everything instead of going through the motions? Brothers and sisters, let's answer the call to change. I love you.